So have you guys played this game? Tetris. I call it Tetris. Tetris. Some of you may call it by other names. You guys have played this game? Yeah, I played. Yeah. So you see, when I uh, in my days, uh, like there was computers were not uh, easily available. And at home, we didn't have a computer uh, or even a desktop for that matter. Only when I entered first year of engineering, I touched my first computer. That too, it was part of the university. So till then, you know, I never used uh, computers. So you can imagine I was not exposed to online games um, in uh, uh, computer games early on. So it was never my uh, like main thing. But when I was doing engineering, I got introduced to some games. Uh, so I was not crazy about them, but once in a while I used to play. And this was one of the games, uh, Tetris. So it was invented in the 1980s, I think by some Russian guy. And then over the years, it has grown in popularity. And uh, there is another game, Pac-Man, which, which was also you know, equally popular around the same time, 80s, 90s, maybe even beyond that. And both are like simple games. Even today, you know, it's possible to implement them with uh, basic programming knowledge. But of course, today we have much more sophisticated games. Uh, we have games which are VR, virtual reality, augmented reality games, games in multiplayer games. Many players logged into the system. They can see their virtual avatars and uh, very sophisticated graphics. And they have gaming engines like, uh, I don't know, Unity, that is one of the gaming engines. So a lot of uh, innovations have happened in gaming. But we are looking back to an old time, 80s, where games were much simpler. And this is the exactly the kind of game that we can implement on a small embedded system like an Arduino. And because I played this game uh, in my student days, I know about this game, so I thought, why not try to make this game run on an Arduino, which is a very small embedded system, limited memory, limited comp uh, uh, computing resources, but still we should be able to implement it. So there are two aspects to it, both hardware and software, and I will cover both of them in today's session. But before getting into uh, the implementation for Arduino, I think we should first get a feel of what the game is, in case some of you have not played this game. So I downloaded from the net uh, a Python code, which is available. Uh, you know, I did not write this. I did not make a single line. I don't think I made any changes to this code. It is available online. And this is based on a Python package called Pygame. So I have created a virtual environment with the Pygame installed. And we are going to run this game. So I will just play this game for some time, maybe a minute or so. So you can see blocks are falling and each block has a different shape. This is the next block which will fall. And if you press, press the down arrow, it will fall faster, right? So that functionality is also there. And then you can, now the next block has come in. So you can make it move right or left. Uh, so this is moving it right, moving it left, and then pushing it down using the down arrow key. This is the next block coming in. You can make it rotate. So you can make the block rotate and then move it to the right, move it down, right, rotate. And every tick, it may be one second, the block uh, falls automatically. You can assume it is falling because of gravity. So here there are there is space at the bottom. So I will move it to the bottom and then I'll push it down. Now the goal of the game is, objective of the game is to complete one row. So then if you complete one row, you, your score will increase. So you can see here, I am almost close to completing this row, but this one is a square. It will not fit in this hole. So I'll put the square to the side. This one, yes, this will fit in here, as you can see here. So this row gets completed and it will get consumed. So my score will also increase. So this is the objective of the game, to complete as many rows as possible. So you can see one more example here. I completed this row. Now the next block has fallen. 
and uh, one more row I am completing, right? Now, if you complete one row at a time, you get certain points. But if you complete two rows, you get more points, kind of a bonus. If you complete three rows at a time, you get even more points. And if you complete four rows at a time, that is actually called Tetris. You get maximum points. That means completing four rows at a time, which is typically possible if you get a vertical block like this one, which just fell uh, before this. So this is the overall uh, you know, basis of the game. Then there are different levels and so on. So hope you understood this. So uh, yeah, this is a Python implementation using the Pygame package. So I showed this just to give you an idea how it is done, how the game works. Because before implementing any game, we should know the game logic. So what are the commands which the user can give? So in our case, it is left, right, down, and rotate, which is uh, the usually an up arrow key. So four commands are possible. Then the objective of the game, we already know. Objective of the game is to complete one or more rows. And you get bonus points if you complete multiple rows in a single shot. So this is the objective. And even if you don't press any command, that is you don't press left, right, down, or rotate, the block will continue to fall at a regular interval. That is every one second or half a second, you see block moves down. The falling block, it moves down one row. So even if you don't press any command, it will move down. But eventually what will happen, there will be no space for the block to fall. Then the game ends. So every game has these parameters. What are the user commands? That is how user can control the game. What is the objective? What is the scoring mechanism? And what is the termination? How does the game terminate? What, what, what condition should be met for the game to terminate? So these are the broad things in a game. Then there are so many other extra things which are like optional things, like adding sound to the game or uh, you know going one level to because a game can uh, be built on multiple levels. If the user is smart, he will complete level one, then he will be upgraded to level two and so on. So like this options can be there for the game. So we are not uh, bothered about those things right now. So this is the broad uh, you know, description of the Tetris game. Now, of course, there are two parts to the game. For making it work on Arduino, we need the hardware. So for that, this is the hardware I have selected. Obviously, we need an Arduino uh, development board. So I had with me an Arduino Uno, and that is what I'm using for the connection. And then we use a dot matrix. If you go online, you will see other people have implemented the same Tetris game on Arduino. But by and large, most of them have implemented in uh, on an LCD display. So you will find the implementations on an LCD display. I did not find any implementation for a 8 by 8 dot matrix display. So I thought, uh, you know, it's good that no one has, at least to my knowledge, no one has implemented that. So I took it upon myself as a like exercise to implement that. In this figure, I am showing only one uh, eight by eight matrix, but in the actual game that I built, I cascaded four of these. And uh, this is available from uh, like any uh, online store or even an uh, electronic store. In Bangalore, if you go to SP Road, you can buy it. So I bought it from SP Road only. So this is the one I bought. So each one is a eight by eight dot, dot matrix and they can be cascaded together. But the interesting thing about this module is it comes with a single PCB. That means all these four are already uh, like uh, cascaded uh, by the module maker. And then you have the controls here, which will connect to your Arduino. And uh, if you go to the market, there are two modules uh, for a dot matrix. So one is a generic module, they call it. It's a eight by eight dot matrix like this. And then it's got a chip here. But for our purpose, this is like inconvenient. Why it is inconvenient? Because uh, every generic module, it will have this uh, chip in between, which will spoil the visualization for our game. Because we want a continuous array like this. So I selected this FC16 module. And 
under this chip, this under this uh, display rather, that is between the display and the PCB, this chip is there for every um, eight by eight uh, display. So this has a better, uh, this is a better form factor or better, uh, it's better suited for our application. So this is what I've selected. And more details are given on this page, how a dot matrix works and so on. But you know, we don't have to get too deep into this because there is there are libraries which will help us drive this dot matrix, right? And uh, of course, this chip that we saw here, Max 7219 uh, chip, this is the driver chip which will control the uh, driving of all the LEDs on a display. Why is it needed? Because it allows our software that is running on the Arduino to do other things. Because without this driver, even without this driver, we can manually do it from software. But our software will get occupied. It will get busy driving the LEDs because it has to do it all the time. And that will prevent us from achieving uh, low latency in processing user comments. So if the software is busy doing updating the display all the time, it will not uh, in real time or near real time be able to do other tasks. So this kind of an approach is best. So dot matrix displays in the market come with a display driver. So this is the chip that does it, Max 7219. So we use that conveniently. And uh, even more interesting is there are libraries to help you program the chip. So our job is even easier, right? So the job uh, in terms of display is easy. In terms of in connections, uh, the connections are also pretty straightforward. So for display, you need VCC and ground, obviously, and the same ground should be used for Arduino. Now VCC 5 volt, we should not draw that from the Arduino board because Arduino has a limited uh, uh, current draw capacity. So yeah, these LEDs will draw more current. So we use a separate uh, DC source. Now, what is a suitable DC source? Fortunately, our uh, uh, mobile phone charger, right? It's a USB charger and it has a, so basically what comes out is 5 volt DC. So what I did, I cut the cable. I have, I will show you that later. I think I have the pictures uh, somewhere. I think I upload it on Meetup, if I'm not mistaken. So I'll open up the Meetup page for today's session. And here I have uploaded three photos. Let's look at this photo. Can you see these two wires here? Yes. Follow my mouse. Yeah, yes. Yeah. This Let is nothing see. but coming from your USB cable, which is connected to your AC adapter. This is your normal phone charger, nothing more than that. What I did, I just cut the cable one end and I exposed the VCC and the ground, which I connected to the breadboard. This is now giving the power supply to our 8 by 8 display. That's it. It is as simple as that. Because in the market, you will not find battery which gives uh, 5 volt. You will find 3.7 volt lithium polymer batteries. You will find 9 volt uh, bigger batteries, but 5 volt, little harder to come by. But you can use your USB charger. You just have to cut the cable. So this is what I did. You can also use your uh, power, uh, like if you have a power, uh, what do you call battery pack or what, what a power bank, you can use that also. But sometimes I found that that doesn't give uh, clean power like your adapter, AC adapter. So I in this setup, I'm using AC adapter. OK. And uh, so this is the LED part. This is the uh, Arduino, which is controlling the driving of these LEDs. The actual intelligence is in the software to control this. Now, of course, you need user input. So for that, we have four keys here. I have a close up, I think, of that. Okay, this is the Arduino, which shows the connections. Next one. Yeah, so you can see on the right side of the breadboard, I have connected four uh, push buttons. So like I discussed earlier, this game requires four different inputs. Left, 
to make the block go left, right. This is down to push it down faster. This is to rotate the block. And then uh, because uh, you want to limit the amount of current going uh, going to the, yeah. So you have resistors and then uh, you have diodes. So what is the purpose of the diode? This is also worth explaining. Now your Arduino has two pins. That is the Arduino, you know. It has two pins uh, which are capable of interrupts. So there are two pins here. Uh, I think for you know it is pin two and three. Only these two pins are capable of interrupts. That means uh, if a push button is pressed, then the interrupt service routine will get called. So that you can configure in your software. Uh, request you to mute your microphone. Yeah. When you, if you have questions, that time you can unmute yourself. So here the purpose of uh, the diode. So the question is, we have four push buttons. So ideally, we need in the ideal world, all four each push button will be connected to its own interrupt pin, interrupt capable pin, and each pin will be uh, configured for a particular interrupt service routine. So if this left pin uh, push button is pressed, it will trigger, let's say the ISR on pin two, and that will process immediately. That will immediately recognize that uh, the user has pushed the left button. So in the ideal world, we will need four interrupt capable pins, but in Arduino, you know, we don't have four, we have only two. So what did I do? Uh, so I, I, I'm using only one pin, which is pin number two for detecting the interrupts from all the four push buttons. So all four are configured to pin two. The ISR, when the ISR runs, it samples the values on each of the push buttons. That means it reads the state of each of the push buttons and it will capture only one state. So I will show the code a little later, but that is the reason why we have these four diodes. So, uh, and this idea, I did not, of course, invent this. This is known in electronics. And uh, this is a YouTube video which someone has released explaining the whole thing. Right here in this example, they are using three push buttons. And these push buttons are again connected to pin number two. And uh, this pin number two is connected to one end of the diode, other end of the diode connected to push button. And uh, the same end is connected to ground through the resistor. So this is the way it happens, and uh, this. Uh, so the logic, I I don't know about this figure, but the logic I have used is similar to this. But generally, in this circuit that I am showing you, the signal is uh, low. When the push button is pressed, it goes high. So if you look at the software configuration as well, I'll show you the configuration here. You can see here. The way the interrupt service routine is attached, it is attached to the rising edge of the pin. So normally the interrupt pin two is low, but when any of these push buttons is pressed, it goes high. And at the rising edge of that uh, data input, this uh, uh, interrupt service routine will get triggered. And the service routine is basically underscore read, which is this. Uh, function that I have written. And uh, because we are multiplexing four push buttons in a single ISR, we sample what is the value of this. And by nature of this if else statement, you can figure out I am giving priority to the left button, but there is no uh, you know, reasoning for this, rational for this. It's just that uh, it doesn't matter to the gameplay. You can give priority to any other button. It does. It doesn't matter. But of course, there are other things which you need to take care. What happens if the user presses two or more push buttons at the same time, very quickly, which can happen, you know, when the user is panicking towards the end of the game. It's quite possible. So then you can improve this code so that you can handle multiple key presses within the routine. But for the simple proof of concept, you know, this was more than enough. So this is the hardware, uh, right? Uh, the rest of the thing is easy. Uh, I, I don't think I need to explain. Uh, 
So before we look at the software, I want to give you a sense of uh, how this game is played. So I have actually dismantled the setup. I did this project about a month, uh, year, week ago, but I made a recording. So I'll play you the recording. Yeah, this is the one. So you can see the block falling. Okay, now my right hand, you can't see in the video. It is controlling the through the push buttons. So down key is pressed, it falls faster. So left key is pressed, so it was then down key. So square block is falling, left key, down, down keys, yeah. Right key, so I'm rotating the block, then make it fall, okay. So, so I'm making it fall faster using the down key. Rotating. Now you see the rows will get completed. So you see rows got completed and they, the higher rows, they move down. So this is just to give you a sense how the entire setup, uh, I got it working and I was happy with the results. Okay, any questions at this point before we look at the software? The software is the key here and that only took more time. But before we get into the software, any questions on the hardware? Or the connections? OK, so no questions. Uh, we can come back to the hardware later also. Now I'll get into the software. Now the first thing is, Arduino, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, Arduino, you know, one of the faults of Arduino, you know, is you cannot attach a debugger to it. There are other Arduino uh, platforms which allow a debugger. So you can put breakpoint, you can do single stepping and so on. But you know, doesn't have that feature. So debugging becomes a challenge. So you are only left with the print of statements. Second thing is because uh, software is complex. And hardware is also, I mean, hardware is uh, not that complex, but you can have loose connections. There are other issues, right, with hardware, whether you are calling the library APIs correctly. So uh, if there is a problem, it becomes very difficult to find or isolate the source of the problem or the bug. So what I had to do was, or I mean, this is what I thought of, and this is how I proceeded with the project. So I separated the hardware from the software. So all the software was, was written using a Arduino, you know, no doubt, but I did not have any push buttons or I did not have the display. The entire software was written only with the Arduino, you know, not even a breadboard. And everything was controlled through the uh, laptop, through my keyboard and uh, a printout on my uh, terminal. So to understand this, let's first look at the class diagram. How did I uh, design or architect this system, the software aspect of it? So this is the class diagram. Uh, I mean, when I say class diagram, it becomes obvious that I have adopted an object-oriented uh, approach to solving this. Uh, so some of you may know uh, the language of uh, Arduino is called wiring. That is the API, they have given it a name called wiring, but fundamentally uh, uh, it's a C++ code. What people call as sketches, uh, you know, Arduino sketches, and that sketch gets converted or converted into a C++ code, and a C++ compiler compiles it into an executable. So for uh, all practical purpose, you are writing C++ code, and uh, you can, uh, use any of the programming constructs of C++. Uh, C++. So I've used class inheritance, public, private, protected, 
all that stuff I've used constructors, destructors, and then uh, some methods are public, some are protected, some are private, and so on. So if you look at the whole thing, this is how it is. So we need a class called board, which manages the display of the board and controlling the blocks on the board. Then you need a class for the block itself. So in Tetris, each block is called a Tetris. You know, this is the what do you call the official terminology. Each block is called a termino. So this is a class by itself. And a board is connected to a tetrimino. And if you see here, a board can have zero or one tetrimino. So what does it mean? It means very simply that when a block is falling, a board is having one active tetrimino. And when there is no tetrimino falling, that means the currently active block has already fallen to the bottom, then it becomes zero. Then the board has to wait for the next block to be generated. Right. So that is why this class diagram says board is associated with zero or one tetrimino. Then on this side, you need uh, user comments. So for that, there is a separate class. So this class called command reader processes comments from the user. Then there is a separate class to keep track of the scores. So this is called the scorer. Right. So every time a row gets completed or a new block falls, right, you can uh, call the scorer to update the score. Now, what is the inheritance part here? So remember, I built all this without using a keep uh, push buttons or using the dot matrix. So everything was done through the serial port. So the development and uh, debugging of the software was done through the serial port. So when done that way, I only instantiated command reader and board. There is no, uh, you know, I did not uh, even write this class keypad reader or dot matrix board. So the whole software was tested using only these classes command reader, board, tetrimino, and scorer. And once the entire game logic was proven to be working, then I introduced these things after, you know, incorporating the changes in the hardware. I started writing these classes, keypad reader, dot matrix reader, and dot matrix board, which basically inherits from board uh, and this one inherits from command reader. So this will give you an overview of how uh, this is game was built. Now let's take a look at this gameplay using only command reader, board, tetrimino, and scorer without using keypad reader and dot matrix board. So this can be done uh, from our laptop. And that is what I'm going to show you now. So already uh, my, but you need an Arduino for this. So my Arduino is connected uh, to my laptop and uh, it is connected on COM12 serial port. Now the thing about Arduino is you have a serial monitor here, right? You have a serial monitor here in Arduino and you can give commands here. See the game has already started. You can see the game running. Blocks are falling. See, this is a block falling. But the problem with this serial interface is that for every command I give, suppose I give command L, I have to press enter because that is how this serial interface works uh, from this ID, which is very troublesome when you are playing a game. Now game is over because the last block which was generated, it has nowhere to go. The earlier blocks are blocking the way. So now the game has ended, right? So this is how the game works. But like I said, this is very troublesome, right? Because for every command, I have to press enter. And this comes in the way of uh, gameplay. So I did not use this serial interface. Instead, I wrote my own serial uh, processing the interface using Python. Right. So this is simple Python code. It is hardly few lines of code. And already there are uh, like Python, you know, it's a vast ecosystem. Already there are uh, packages to manage serial communications and then uh, capturing key presses from the keyboard. So that is what I used. So what do we do here? We capture the uh, like associate the keyboard with uh, certain, uh, just like our uh, 
ISR on Arduino, here also we associate the key presses to a particular function. And this function processes the commands. Then uh, here we open the communication with the serial port. And then we, uh, yeah, so some decoding error, if there are any, we handle that as well. And then we give a sleep, one millisecond sleep. So this way we don't have to uh, press enter. Whenever a key press is done, immediately it goes, it calls this function and it writes to the serial port. Once it writes to the serial port, that will get processed by our Arduino. That is by our game, it will get processed. And that is implemented in the command reader. That is what the command reader does in the read function. So to give you a sense of how this works, so let's play the game. Right, so Python serial display from 12. So you see game is playing. Now I make the block move to the left. So you can see it moved to the left. I make this move to the right. So you see, you see the block is falling down. Now the next block has come to the left, but I want to move it to the right. So I move it to the right and so on. So you got the idea, right? So now I can do the entire gameplay from my laptop through keyboard and serial port communication without relying on the dot matrix display or the push buttons. Because when you get hardware involved and software is also kind of in development, it's difficult to isolate the problem. So this is the approach I took. I built the software first, got the game working. And then once all this is working, then I built the interfacing to the keypad and the dot matrix. So these two classes I wrote later, once all these things were proven. So now uh, uh, if you study the code, it should be fairly obvious. But just to give you a broad uh, overview. Uh, so all this code is open source. I will share the link with you later. So this is, uh, these are all the functions uh, or the files rather. These are all the files which are there. Common.h, which is included in almost every CPP file. It has nothing but Arduino.h and then the debug. So if you want to enable debugging while during development, you can do this. But like I said, I had to do this only because I'm using Arduino Uno. But if you are using a different type of platform, I think uh, like Arduino Mega, for example, there you can add a debugger. That you can put breakpoints and all that. So you don't have to rely on uh, serial communications to do debugging. Okay. So coming back to the code, so common.h, that's fine. I just showed you this. Then uh, the next one is command reader. So command reader, you can see it has only one public function, read, which reads the command from the serial port. So this is the implementation of that. So if anything is available on the serial port, it will read that command and it will capture that command. Is it which key is pressed? And it will return that command back to the caller. And who is calling this? It is being called from the main program, the main sketch. So here, every time it goes to through the loop, it will, uh, where is that? Here it calls the, yeah, this is where it reads the command from the serial port. So if anything is read, that means the user has supplied a command. If the user has not supplied any command, this whole thing processing the command will get skipped. So that is about command reader and the equivalent uh, file here. Now let's look at the board. Uh, so board is a little bit more complex as you can see, but the public functions of the board are simple. So this one is a constructor which tells you how many uh, rows and columns the board has. So just now when I, when we were playing the uh, game, you would have noticed that I configured it as eight by eight, right? Because that is how we played the game just now. You can see here eight by eight, but in the actual case, it it is like this because like I said, we are cascading four dot by dot, eight by eight dot matrix displays. So in those cases, you know, it will be configured like this. So that 
uh, like flexibility is there with the constructor. When you are constructing the board, you can choose what to do. And then destructor is freeing the memory. So memory is one of the challenges I had when I was writing this code, right? There are certain things wrong with the pointers and so forth. So I had to fix them. Then uh, this is every time, you know, a new tick comes. That is, let's say one second, let's say is the tick. Or yeah, so whenever the fall logic has to be implemented, this method gets called. Then processing the command. So once the command is there, we saw here, right? We read the command from the serial port, then we give it to the uh, board to process the command. So what the board does? So it moves. If it is a left command, it invokes this method move it to the left move it to the right move down rotate and then after doing all this it will check are we ready to clear any full rows right so that logic is built in here and if full rows is true then you can you know update the scores right so that logic is also here score scorer yeah you can update the scores as well then uh, you know Yeah, so that is the logic here. Mm. Processing command, game over, print. Right now, yes, this print is important. So now we were playing the game through the serial port. Remember? So that means we have to do this print. This is this print is not just for debugging. This is actually for playing the game over the serial port, and uh, we are treating our uh, this terminal as the display. We don't have a dot matrix at this point. This terminal is the display. So this print is essential. So all the, the entire board is printed to the terminal, and this helps the user to understand the current state of the game and supply the commands for the next iteration. What is interesting is, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe only one, most of the code is very simple to understand. Only one thing I want to point out is, uh, see when the, uh, like I said here in the class diagram, uh, the, the board is associated with either zero or one falling block or tetramino. So when the block has completely fallen, then it gets fixed to the board because after it has fallen to the bottom, it will not move anymore. Okay, so that is important. So that logic, is given here. I'll show you that logic. Clear full rows. Uh, okay, clear full rows. Four rows. Add deactivate. Rows to clear. Okay, locate memory. Move down. Okay, let's look at this. Move TM. Okay. Okay. So this is where we actually make the block move. So before making the block move, we might have already, I mean, this offset, this offset X and Y offset varies. If it is a left, then one will be minus one. And if it is down, this will be plus one. So if I can go back here, you can. See here, move right. Move right is nothing but move TM 0, 1. Likewise, move left is move TM 0, minus 1, and so on. So the basic logic is implemented inside a single method called move TM, and the offset determine which way you want to move. Rotate is a little bit complex because you have to first rotate the falling block, and after it is rotated, you have to move it. Move it uh, like Default move, which is uh, zero zero. Okay, so after it is uh, so during this move phase, we can make out whether it has reached the bottom or it has reached an obstruction. That means below it there is another block which is already blocking. So that means the block cannot fall any further or it cannot move. So when that happens, we deactivate the block. And then we do the final deactivation here once we come out of the loop. So this fixes the block to the 
uh, board. So this is what is given in the comment. Fix the tetrimino to the board. That means it has fallen. Once it has fallen, then the active tetrimino can be cleared and the, its memory can be released. Right? So there can be only one active falling block in the gameplay. And once the block is fallen, the memory is cleared, the pointers are cleared. And then it is up to the overall game logic here to create a new uh, tetrimino. This here or in the update fall itself, we will do it. So let's go back to the board. So here, there will be a call to add. So here, add. This is where we add a new tetrimino. And uh, somewhere, update fall. So you can see here, okay, something is falling. If nothing is falling, that means there is no active tetrimino. Then you add a new one. And so on. So this is how it works. So let me conclude now by how this is updated for keypad, that means our push buttons, and for dot matrix. So remember, these are all inherited classes, derived classes. So let's take uh, keypad reader. So it derives from command reader. So command reader, as you know, already had a method called read, but that was reading from the serial port. But now we want our gameplay to read from the keypad, uh, which we have uh, connected on the breadboard. So this, this is what uh, you know we call function uh, overriding in C++. So the method of the derived class will override the method of the base class. Then we enhance the functionality of the base class with an extra method. See, command reader was serial port. There was nothing to configure except the baud rate, which was fixed in the constructor or wherever uh, it, it was fixed basically. But in this particular case, uh, we need to know which pins are connected to the push buttons. So that we configure in the set pins method. Then the other things are uh, internal to the class. So we don't expose them. So they are private. So let's go back. Uh, to the actual implementation keypad reader, this is how it is. So in set pins, which is which will be called immediately after, you know, the, the class is instantiated, object is created. So we, uh, you know, we save the pin numbers and then we configure all of them as input, which, which is what it is. Then we attach uh, pin number two. So we said earlier that two pins are capable of interrupt in Arduino, you know, two and three. So we are taking pin number two and attaching it to this particular method here on the rising edge. Okay, so this is how it is done. Now you will notice that we don't directly call this function because this is supposed to be triggered by the interrupt, right? So when the user pushes the push button, this will get called. And as an ISR, we should not spend too much time inside the ISR. We should do minimal processing and get out quickly. So all we do in this ISR is capture the command. What is the push button the user has pressed? So we don't do any other processing here. We just capture the command into this variable. And because this variable is updated inside the ISR, we, uh, we are careful to note that this should be volatile. And then in our overall game logic here, here every time we go through the loop, we read from the keyboard. This is the where the actual read happens. And this is a different method. It's not the same method. This is a different method without the underscore. This is the public method, similar to what we had in our command reader. This is the public method read. And what this read does, it looks at the command which was updated by the interrupt service routine. So here we interrupted the variable, uh, we updated the variable, and then here we read from that and clear it. And then we return it. Then the rest of the gameplay will take care of updating the display based on the command given by the uh, user. 
so you see most of the display update is done inside software it is not done on the so if you look at the board.h there is a pool double pointer underscore b if you are confused by this not to worry it is nothing but a two dimensional array of boolean values and each element of this two dimensional array represents the dot in the dot matrix display. So if you have 32 by 8, you will have 32 by 8 Boolean values here. That is what it is. And uh, so the, when we say we are updating the board, we are actually updating this variable, nothing more than that. We are not actually updating the uh, dots on the dot matrix display. It's all done virtually on this variable. Likewise, when the tetrimino is falling, we are updating the position of the tetrimino using this xy coordinates. Or for that matter, when it is rotated, right? These coordinates are updated and so on. So that is what everything is done virtually. The actual update to the display is done in the dot matrix board class. So this coming back to this class, you see again constructor, destructor. OK, we know setting the pins just like our you know, keyboard, keypad reader, this also has pins, but it has three pins, data input, chip select, and then the clock. So three inputs are there. Then uh, print. So this is where, this is the important uh, method. So this is where, you know, we take what is there in our virtual display, which is our underscore B two dimensional array. And this we push it to the display. So all the magic happens here. And this is something that we don't need to worry about because this is coming from a library called MD Max 72XX.h. Right? So this library offers us these kind of things. Right? So we rely on that library to simply update the dot matrix display. So the actual interfacing to the dot matrix display is trivial. Most of the complexity is inside the board.cpp, which is tasked with updating this virtual display. OK, so that is what it is. Uh, and uh, yeah, coming back to this dot matrix display, I created one more extra method here, test print. The reason is this is not strictly needed, but initially when I was developing this, uh, the, the dot matrix display wasn't working properly. So I wanted a way to like lose connection or the battery pack was not giving power correctly. So different issues. So uh, yeah, so we just to be sure that the hardware is okay. I had to create this, then I can go and you know debug the software. So that was the reason this extra method is created just to test. Whether I am or it could be simply that I have not correctly understood this API. I'm using it incorrectly. That's another reason. So for those reasons, this you know test print method was created. OK, so that's it. Uh, any questions? I hope you found this useful. Uh, that's all I had to share. Any questions? We can take those questions now. So, okay. Arvind, this was a very nicely presented talk. You know, you covered every aspect of these things. Uh, the hardware and the software and how you architected the whole things. I thought it was very, very well done. Thank you so much. Thanks for that. Yeah. OK, uh, now uh, before I sign off. This is of course not perfect, right? So already I put some to do comments here. To do possible game improvements. Reduce tick and factor. See right now these two are fixed. Tick and factor are fixed. This is 100 and the factor is 5, I think. Later I changed it to 5. But then 
you but this is very slow gameplay you might have seen the earlier video so as the user progresses to higher levels you can dynamically change reduce this so that the game goes faster so this will make the game more challenging for the uh, gamer so that is one thing display score and game over message to the user so now currently when the game ends on the dot matrix nothing appears so the score and the game over message can be displayed to the user currently that kind of a display is done on the serial this this method here uh, right i showed you the method of board dot cpp this one gives a message in the print that game over and uh, or maybe it is here here we give a message right game over and then inside print we show that uh, what is this current score so that we can incorporate in the dot matrix itself that is another improvement third improvement is like adding sounds so when a block is falling or you are giving commands you can add unique sounds to the gameplay which will make it interesting and when the row gets completed or two rows get completed or four rows that is the ultimate right that's what they call tetris when four rows got complete get completed you can give a very unique sound so that will make the game more interesting then earlier i showed you one command uh, where you know to process the keys right why can't we improve this to handle multiple keys of course i just wrote this to do command but you have to ascertain is it really needed so when you only when you play the game you you will know is it really required that's something you have to look into or you can achieve the similar behavior by doing some software debouncing and uh, making adjustments to the tick all right so that is another way in which you can uh, make sure that you don't miss any uh, ultimate uh, what we really want we don't want to miss any commands from the user that that's the whole point here so those kind of adjustments can be made okay now where is this code uh, the code is in our uh, devopedia github account so this is where it is this is the repo uh, Devopedia or IoT examples, and inside this there is a subfolder called Arduino. Go into that. With plenty of examples which we used to do in earlier trainings and workshops. So there I added one folder Tetris, right? So this is where the